the Thousand Yard Stare, shell shock in World War I. The Thousand Yard Stare, it can be simply defined as the unfocused gaze of someone who has seen too much. It's a characteristic of those who have experienced war and combat zones and is most commonly associated with the victims of shell shock, or in today's terminology, PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. By the time World War I came around in 1914, technology and weaponry had advanced greatly since the days of Napoleon. Battlefields were deadlier, with more varied and horrific ways of attacking and killing the enemy, leading to psychological trauma en masse in a way that really hadn't been seen before. The first recorded use of the term shell shock was by Dr. and Captain Charles S. Myers, writing a report for the paper The Lancet in February 1915. In it, he examined the cases of three young men he studied, two privates and a corporal, breaking down the symptoms they displayed. From here, a list of common but extremely varied symptoms of shell shock was defined, which included sleeplessness, anxiety, fear, harassing sights and experiences, mania, mental confusion, memory loss, hallucinations and delusions, severe psychosis, and in some cases, a complete mental breakdown or mental stupor. As well as these mental symptoms, physical symptoms were also recorded such as headaches, nausea, and dizziness, also referred to as neurasthenia. Dr. William Aldrin Turner, building off Meyer's report, wrote about his findings at base hospitals in France. Dr. Turner spoke about neurasthenia and the impact of witnessing extreme war violence on an individual. He stressed the link between physical symptoms and mental issues, strongly identifying cases where mental shock led to other physiological symptoms, such as deaf mutism that continued long after it should have subsided. Although 1915 was the first recorded mention of shell shock, it's now estimated that by December 1914, 7 to 10% of all British officers and 3 to 4% of other ranks were suffering from it. In the cases of those with neurasthenia, Turner recommended rest and recovery at home, although the degree of severity of nervous shock and neurasthenia affected his recommendations. You know, I've always been fascinated by how things work, especially math, data, and computer science. And if you're like me, curious and eager to learn, then I've got something amazing to share with you. Imagine learning these complex subjects in a way that's not only interactive, but really fun. That's what Brilliant offers. With thousands of lessons covering everything from basics to more advanced topics, and with new lessons added every month, it's like an ever-expanding universe of knowledge. Take their new course on artificial intelligence, for example. You're not just reading about AI. You're actually engaging with interactive puzzles that teach you how neural networks operate. It's kind of like playing a game, but you're learning a real-world concept. The best part? Brilliant customizes content to fit your skill level. Whether you're just starting Starting out or you're ready to dive deep into data analysis or programming, there is something there for you. You progress at your own pace with helpful hints and step-by-step -step solutions to guide you. If you sign up now, you get to start free for 30 days. Plus, the first 200 people who sign up using the discount URL will get 20% off an annual plan. Just visit brilliant.org slash simple history to get started. Give it a try yourself to see what I'm talking about. The three men that Myers observed had all been victims of recent nearby shell explosions, suffering from mental fog thereafter. But Turner had the benefit of observing multiple participants over a longer stretch of time, meaning he was able to draw further distinctions between differing types of shell shock, which he referred to as nervous shock. In fact, Turner may have been the first to recognize that it was not just acts of war, such as a nearby explosion or one specific traumatic incident that led to those cases of shock, but that what he referred to as general wear and tear could impact mentally over time, resulting in shell shock. Interestingly, Turner also identified that it's not just war that caused this, but specific war conditions were more likely to cause cases of shell shock than others. For example, Turner observed that the intensity of the fighting on the front lines impacted this, highlighting that more cases were seen from the severe fighting in Flanders and around Ypres than other battles. These earlier battles notably suffered from heavy artillery fire, which could go some way to explain the increase in number of shell shock cases. Regardless, shell shock was both a new and increasing epidemic during World War I, with physicians working hard to understand the new phenomenon, at the same time as dealing with countless cases of it in their frontline soldiers. 
While the early reports of Myers and Turner are quite positive, saying that recovery is favorable and likely for these soldiers and that time is simply needed in most cases for rest and recovery, it later became apparent this wasn't quite the case. By 1916, very few cases of shell shock had returned to fighting. At one Red Cross hospital, only 21% of discharges returned to military duty, and Gordon Holmes, the consultant neurologist to the British Expeditionary Forces, reported that the base hospitals in France, where the fighting was strongest, were seeing return rates of 30 to 40% in comparison to the UK's 4 to 5%. As cases increased, understanding almost seemed to go backward, more than likely due to the panic over realization of how many soldiers were affected in Britain. Although initially physicians like Myers and Turner advocated for hypnotherapy psychotherapy measures to help treat shell shock, over the next few years the efficacy of their methods began to be questioned. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Holmes was brought in to replace Myers, and his methods, while more in line with the British Army's desires, unfortunately did a lot to undermine recent discoveries on the impact of shell shock on its sufferers, and set in motion a string of events that led to the demonization of those dealing with the mental illness. Notably, his reporting on relapse rates was much lower than the actual figures and didn't take into account the high number of the men treated for shell shock that never returned to active warfare. Sadly, fundamentally, the general British belief became one that shell shock was down to a weakness of mind and spirit rather than anything else. It's possible this general mentality is what actually made shell shock so prominent in the British forces, with the general populace believing strongly in the mantras, stiff upper lip, and we are British, we carry on, that led to a general subconscious abhorrence to any ailment of a mental nature. Unfortunately, things only got worse from there for those who experienced shell shock. Holmes subsequently shut Myers' centers dedicated to treating the illness and reallocated them to soldiers with venereal diseases. It is he who we partly have to thank for the decades-long perception of the casualties of war, reducing shell shock to simple cowardice or feebleness of mind. While his legacy may not have been favorable to him, it is somewhat well-deserved, as his actions at the time directly led to some of the harsh treatment methods these patients experienced. For example, the most severe cases of shell shock were shipped off to mental asylums and dedicated hospitals, where treatment ranged wildly from the reasonable to the completely inhumane. The most famous or infamous example of this was the work by Dr. Lewis Yeland, whose methods, even then, were seen as controversial. Yeland strongly believed in Faradism, the use of electricity in therapy, much like the electroshock therapy used until the 1980s. In his 1918 work, Historical Disorders of Warfare, he gleefully documented the treatment types he used on sufferers of shell shock, describing them as successful despite their barbarism. One of the main methods Yeland favored included applying electric shocks to the throat, neck, and limbs forcibly for horrifying long extended periods of time, sometimes berating the patient verbally while doing so. In some cases, he went so far as to also apply hot plates to the skin and put out lit cigarettes on the end of the patient's tongue. What that would do to cure shell shock may be anybody's guess, but Yeland was convinced that his methods were the right ones. The nuances and different treatments of shell shock varied dramatically across World War I, and by the end of the conflict, there was still no great consensus on the illness among medical professionals. What followed was silent suffering. Soldiers, unwilling or unable to discuss their shell shock, coupled with the disdain and belief of cowardice that stained those who experienced it, meant that over the next decade after the war, little progress was made in understanding shell shock or its effects. The most notable inquiry was that of the Southborough Report in 1922, but even in the paper's findings, opinions over the cause of shell shock were sharply divided among the groups of experts consulted. Rather than addressing this difficulty in defining the key causes of shell shock, the paper focused on recommendations for future affairs and largely blamed the illness on things such as a lack of training in troops in certain battles. Regardless of the justifications and investigations, the fact remains that to the British military at least, World War I shell shock sufferers were largely regarded as cowards and in many instances were even shot for it on the front lines.
even putting aside the fact that many would balk in the face of war and certain death, these men were not cowards, but sufferers of an illness brought on by the horrendous reality they were forced to face daily. They deserve recognition and an apology for the reputation they earned because of this. But incredibly, it took until 2006 for an official pardon to be issued to those shot in the name of cowardice during World War I, and decades for sufferers of mental illness to be taken seriously. Remember, that's brilliant.org slash simple history. I can't wait to hear about what you'll discover on your next own learning journey with Brilliant. Leave a comment below and tell me what you learned.